it and the food even accidentally. That's that's where the aggression is. So if we were to reach down to grab the bowl, she would she would oh she would she would she would go bat you know what crazy. Really? Okay. <laughs> so so let's see what that looks like. So let's see let's see what let's see what it looks like. I just want to see it. I want to see the aggression and then go from there. Okay. All right. So how do we do that? Uh, I'll give you some food. You can give it to her and you can take it back. All right, let's do that. God help you. All right. Okay, so she's let me she's let me take it. Um, is it mainly just you, do you think? Well, I have happen all... sometimes it was when you're feeding dogs, is that they go in that super intense, excited state of mind, and then all of a sudden everything becomes instinctual for them. So what ends up happening is like if they're in the animal kingdom, and let's, let's talk about that a little bit, just so it gives you a better understanding of kind of what's happening with the aggression and the food. So whenever you have a, a pack of dogs, let's say that bully stick I had earlier was on the floor, and then um, two dogs started to come up to it at the same time, right? They ha one has to defer to the other one. So what ends up happening is usually the one that's most manipulative, most confident, or most dominant will end up getting that, and then the other one will defer and step back, right? But as far as the pack goes, there's a possession law, and that is that possession is nine-tenths of the law. So if the dog already has the object in their possession, things happen differently at that point. So if another dog comes and moves in, that dog has every right to defend what he has in his possession, his food, usually. The reason why is because it is the survivability. If a dog gets punked about getting their food taken away every single time, later on, he becomes weak, he becomes tired, and he's not very efficient, and then he'll, he will eventually die. So it is a super survival instinct for them, right? Um, but usually, how it goes with a pack is normally once a dog has possession of something, the pack generally will leave that dog alone. Even the out so generally, once a dog has possession of something, the uh, you shouldn't be interrupting, technically. But what's going on is that's an instinct that she no longer needs, right? So when we deal with dogs, we have that critical socialization stage between the eight to sixteen weeks, where we can get rid of all this fight and flight instincts for survival that happens naturally and almost re, you know, on a reflex basis because we don't need it in this kind of environment. So what we're gonna have to do to try to control that instinctual state of mind is we have to make sure that she's not triggered on an emotional level, which means that we have to work on that intensity as she's eating. So what I'm going to do at this point to work on that is I'm gonna go ahead and get the food, but first I need to make sure I control the excitability. So, hey, shh. So right now she's in that sitting position, right? We know that's an anticipation of something, mm -hmm. right? That sitting position is an anticipation of movement. So we're gonna wait, okay? I'm waiting for that state of mind to change, which it hasn't changed as of yet. Um, my, my walk routine, mm -hmm. I said the word. Mm -hmm. um, what I've been doing, because, okay, so if I were to take the time here. So really quick, see how she yeah. just laid down? So that's showing acceptance, mm -hmm. which, is, which means that now she's just accepting the situation she's finding herself in. But this is actually going a little bit beyond acceptance. This is more of the calm demeanor, because look, the hips are rolled and the head is down, so now we're going, we're going calm. Okay. Acceptance would have been that Egyptian mm -hmm. sphinx stage, right? Right, right. So now that we have that acceptance, now, we have that calm state, this is the only time I start going to go to that food. So you see she's still kind of fighting that. She's already knowing, hey, he's gonna go grab some food, but this is her controlling her intensity, and that which is her responsibility, not, not yours. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab food, and we're gonna see kind of what happens to her emotionally, because this is an emotional trigger for her that she can't help. So right. we'll see how much self-control she has. And that's what it really it's about. It's about do you have the self-control to control your emotional outburst? And that is only something that she can do. She's the one that has to practice that self-control. But you have to give her some sort of exercise where she can start learning to hone that skill. And that's where that meditative hold command or that meditation state that we were teaching 
was going to lead up to this. Right, 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 got it. So as I get the food, go ahead and continue with your question. So anyway, what I've been doing, just to make it so that I can leave for, to, to, to on our W-A-L-K, although I think she can spell now, Yeah. Um, is I will get her to sit at the... All right, so we just saw that break? Yeah. Hey, shh. So right now I'm already I'm giving I'm I'm looking at her with you know with a with a stare, letting her know, hey, you just made a mistake. I'm waiting hey, sh I'm waiting for her mind to go calm so that way the lesson can be ready to learn. She's in an excited state right now. So even if I drug her back, it might still cause some barrier frustration where she's even more frustrated oh, yeah. because we won't let her at least watch the process of getting right. her that food. Hey. So we're staying, I'm staying here for a little while because I'm letting her know, you just made everything, there we go, there we go. Now her body just went into a more relaxed state. I'm letting her know, what you just did just prolonged everything, right? And also, if I were to grab the leash while she's in that excited state because she wants to see prepare the food, she could bite even then. Yeah. Right? Because you won't let her have any control of seeing you, you know, uh, start the feeding process. So here I am, back over here again. Hey, shh. And again, I'm going to wait. So remember, anytime a dog is standing on all fours, that's an ent that's they're going to move. Oh, yeah. That is intent on moving, right? Anytime the dog is sitting, that is an anticipation of movement. It's a temporary hold. Every time the dog lays down, it's just accepting the fact that they're just gonna have to be there for a while. Anytime the hips roll and the head down, we have that calm, that calm demeanor. Um, and we never wanna tell the dog to do the sit stay. We don't wanna tell the dog to wait. We don't wanna tell the dog to lay down because I don't want the dog to do it because we asked them to. I want the dog to sit and lay down on their own so we have an accurate understanding of what state of mind they're in before we decide to go right. forward with the, with the training, right? So she'll sit and lay down if it's a dog command because you asked her to, but it doesn't mean that that's the state of mind she's in. She's only laying down because you asked her to. There was one trainer a while ago that wrote a book on trick training, um, and, uh, and that's kind of what I think obedience is a little bit. Hey, is a little bit of, uh, a little bit of trick training. And the reason why um, I say that is because she was teaching this technique on, on bowing. Oh, we can teach the dog to do a bow. So when you do your dog tricks, you can say take a bow and the dog will do a bow. And then later on in the book she said, and also what's really good about teaching the dog a bow is that when you go to a dog park and you see a nervous dog, you can ask your dog to take a bow because that's considered a play bow in dog communicative language. That, and the play bow is simple. Anytime a dog does a play bow, where their rear end is up and their body is down and then they jump up, what that literally means to another dog, especially if a dog sees it, is everything that I'm about to do after that play bow is all in play. If I growl, if I grab your collar, if I try to go for your feet, you should know it's all in play because it came after that play bow. So now what she's doing is she's going in public at a dog park, she sees a nervous dog, so she says, take a bow, so that dog does a play bow, which that dog understands, but what that dog is not realizing is that that dog's not doing a play bow because he wants to play. That dog's only doing a play bow because that's what he was asked to do, but that's not the state of mind that the dog was in, and that will cause a very dangerous situation, you know? Um, so we want to, because that dog could go say, oh, he just did a play bow, so I could bite on him now. But that wasn't really a play bow. I just did that because my owner did it. Now I'm going to bite you for doing that. Right, so it causes this huge misunderstanding. So the dog training commands are, are, are I mean, are, are good for puppy training because they're useful, you know, when you need them. But when it comes to communication, sometimes the dog training ends up jarbling a lot of that, right. and and it's not accurate. So right now we still have the anticipation of, of of movement, and there we go. Now we have that acceptance again. Now we're going to start over. again 
And this is where you just have to really take the time to start letting her know, hey, this is our new rule. We'll take as long as you need until you understand that rule. There's no, there's no rush to the feeding ritual at all. So I'm really terrified to ask the next, next question. So from now yeah. on, do I need to do this with her when I hear her? Or can I do it sometimes and not others? At this if time, I mean, at um, this time, you'd want to be consistent. You will want to do this every single time you feed her, yes. However, it's not going to take this long. Because after a while, she'll understand the pattern, she'll understand the routine, and she'll go into that state of mind much faster because of you being consistent with it. Um, and the feeding ritual should only take you maybe two minutes. Shouldn't be any time. Right now it's a little bit longer. But if you want it to stick and you want to be able to control her intensity when she eats, so that way she doesn't go into that instinctual uh, fight and flight or hunger instinct, then you'll want to make sure that you take the time in the beginning right. portion at least. <clears throat> So the difference about what we're doing here is because most dog trainers are going to use um, more of an operant conditioning approach, uh -huh. and maybe a positive, uh, positive reinforcement approach, or even a correctional approach to this. But what we want to do is we want to take a more of a classically a classical condition approach, a more of an associative, associative learning process instead. Because those are the behaviors that stick the most. With, with operant conditioning, you know, treating or even correcting, uh, even based on science, um, the behavior diminishes unless you reward on an unpredictable basis or unless you correct on an un unpredictable basis. But then what ends up happening is you, you still have to have that reward come in at some point or another to, to help maintain that. So one of the things, one of the uh, comments that I really like that um, a behaviorist, Lynn Boki, which is one of Cesar Milan's protégés, I really like what he said once in a seminar was, if you have, if you, if you're going to be using treats um, to to train a dog, that has to be maintained by treats. If you're going to use force to train a dog, it has to be maintained by force, right? And we don't want to do any of those approaches. What I want to do is I want to change her perception. I want to change her association. So when the doorbell rings and the dogs bark at the door to see who's on the other side, that behavior that they learn is an associative learned behavior. It's a classically conditioned behavior that they learn because they started to put the two together. When I hear the door knock, somebody's on the other side. It's happened 20 times in a row. I know there's somebody on the other side. And that is an association that now triggers an emotional response. And that emotional response or that behavior that the dog learned is almost a permanent behavior. Fears, anxiety, aggression, frustration become permanent behaviors. Your operant conditioning, those are temporary behaviors unless you, uh, unless you continue to reinforce those behaviors throughout life. But I want to make this a permanent behavior. So I'm going to do it through associated learning instead. And so that's why what we're doing is I'm just creating an association. There's no need to correct her for doing anything wrong. There's no need to treat her because that's gonna put her into an intense state of mind where she's gonna act more aggressive. I'm just being patient until she starts to associate. Every time he goes there and I follow, he puts me back. That's happened five times in a row. So I might as well stay here. Now we have her learning you know, through an association, not necessarily through operant. And this will probably trigger her, you see? Yep. Hey. So right there, I use my auditory pressure. That's good. Right. So she knows that was that was upset. But I'm gonna give her some direction. She's looking, she's actually looking around for the food. She thought that I just put the bowl down, so she's like, okay, where do I get to eat? So she's still in an, an anticipation state of mind. 
There's yawning, so we have a calming behavior, which shows that she's a bit stressed. She's like, I'm tired of waiting for this food. This, this needs to happen now, All right? So it's just gonna be a matter of teaching her that patience. And it's, and it's no different with children. You have to learn to stand in line at Disneyland. You have to learn to wait for your food to get here. There can't be taking the fork and the knife and banging on the table saying, come on, hurry up, I'm hungry. It just, it's just a matter of patience. And like I said, from the very foundation of just teaching her that meditative hold command, it's the same exact thing they do with children in kindergarten school and first grade. It's like, it's nap time. All the kids on the giant Thomas the Train carpet taking a nap for 45 minutes. It's part of the school curriculum. And everybody knows none of those kids ever take a nap. But remember, that's not the reason why it's part of the curriculum. It's to start teaching the children from a very young age how to calm their minds, how to self-soothe, how to practice self-control, what to do with your mind when there isn't anything to do in the room. And sometimes it gets a little bit uncomfortable because you're just not able to do anything and, it's, and your nerves kick in and your anxiety kicks in because you want to do something. But one of the hardest processes for children as well as people as well as dogs to learn is how to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's the, hard, that's the hard part. And it sounds like two oxymorons. Well, how can you be comfortable being uncomfortable? Well, that's, it's, it's like, we'll just describe your first date. When you went on a first date, you were uncomfortable. But you're trying to be comfortable with the person that you're just meeting for the first time. And eventually you will get comfortable in that uncomfortable moment. And then pretty soon over time, you're not nervous on any date anymore because you've been on 20 of them. So it's no longer an uncomfortable feeling for you anymore. But at first, you have to learn, how do I get comfortable with this situation? Right? And it's not a negative thing, it's a daily living thing. How do I get comfortable as a wolf uh, sitting, waiting for the caribou to find that perfect one? I'm impatient, I'm hungry right now, I, I, I'm already uncomfortable, I'm starving. But I have to learn to get comfortable in this state so I can make sure I catch the right caribou, the one that looks the weakest out of the pack. So waiting is a very important part of just life. But what happens is a lot of dog obedience instructors or a lot of dog trainers do the whole waiting incorrectly. So they'll have the wait at the door, they'll have wait for your food. And then the dog sits there all excited and tense and they're like, oh my gosh, she's doing so good, I can't believe it. You can tell she's trying really, really hard. And then the trainer will go, okay, go it. And then, whoop, then the dog gets to eat. That causes food aggression. Because what you're doing is you're not teaching the dog to wait you're teaching the dog to have intensity and anxiety until you release and you say, that's okay, you can get it now. And so that is your lesson every day and that's a horrible ritual to do. So a lot of the times, uh, a lot of the times the dog training techniques that you get are from a behavioral standpoint, but a lot of times dog trainers adopt these uh, behavioral standpoints so they can add it to their curriculum without really understanding the foundation of why the behaviors was doing that to begin with. And so what a behaviorist is doing when they're putting the food down, they're asking the animal to wait. They're not letting the animal know, I'm in control of the resource, I'm the boss, and I'll let you have it when I say you can have it because I'm the leader. That's the whole point of this wait game. That's, that's not what the behaviorist is doing. What the behaviorist is doing is waiting for the dog to be ready to eat. And that has nothing to do with me. That has to do with patience and waiting on, her, on, on, uh, on Penny, on her. So now, putting the, bo the food bowl down she'll go after it. And I don't want her running to the food bowl, I wanna bring the food to her, eventually, where she can be calm. But right now, at this point, where I have a calm state, I wanna keep promoting this calm state, and you'll start, see how we're getting intensity? So right now, she just went from laying down, she just went from an intense state. Hey, so right there, I'm getting her attention. So the auditory sound that I'm giving is not a correctional thing. Remember the auditory sound that I'm making, any sound, snap the fingers, if you want to do the seasonal lunch, if you want to say hey, if you, you know, any sound is just meant to get the dog's attention to give you some eye contact. Once you get the eye contact, the communication happens there, right? So I don't, I don't use the word no, not that I don't believe in the word no, see now we're going back to a calmer state. I'm just, um, uh, I'm just not using no as a marker for a correction, I'm using it for attention to get attention, right? So that was a hand feed, right? But knowing when to hand feed is important because even then, again, this is a behavioral technique that behaviors do for fixing food aggression. 
And dog trainers have always adopted this idea as well. Oh, you should start feeding your dog by hand. And so everybody does it, but it doesn't work. Well, the reason why it's not working is because you're, you're getting the information from a, from a dog trainer and the dog trainer is not showing you correctly when to do the hand feeding. Because right now the hand feeding is, is not the right time to do it because we have the dog in an intense state of mind right now. There you go. Did she growl or was that thing? Oh, it was the leash. She didn't growl at all. So this exercise in itself is, is really showing her, hey, you know, Tony's in control of this resource, but she really needs to understand that um, she's receiving the food, she's not taking the food. There's a huge difference there. Oh, yeah. But if she's in an excited, intense state of mind and you give her the food and she eats it, she's not understanding that it's being received. She's understanding that I'm taking it from your hand. And that can, that can cause a whole bunch of other misconceptions on her part. So just imagine if you were doing trick-or-treating, right? If you were doing trick-or-treating and all of a sudden some kid knocks and goes, trick-or-treat, and you say, oh, okay, you know, I have a lollipop for you. And the kid comes over and goes, <clears throat> and they grab it from you. Oh, that's, give me that lollipop back. I was gonna give it to you anyway. This is trick-or-treat. Why would you just snag it from my hand like that? Like, with, with like, entitlement. Give me back that candy. Say trick-or-treat, trick-or-treat. Would you like a lollipop? Yes, please. Okay, can you take it from me nicely? Yes. Sorry, Larry. Right? And that happens with kids all the time. When kids get too excited, too intense, things slip out of their mouth that they're not supposed to say, that their parents say, hey, didn't I tell you not to talk like that at the dinner table? So sometimes even with children, you have to control the intensity of the excitement of the children at the dinner table so they don't say things inappropriate or, or they can, you know, they remember to say please, they remember to say thank you because they're already in a calmer thinking state of mind. But when you get excited children, that's when people fall, hit their heads, fun and games till somebody loses an eyeball, <laughs> mommy, Billy hit me, you know, that's when all that starts to take place. So right now she's still uh, in anticipation of the food. Why wouldn't she be? She's already in associative state of mind that, hey, Tony's been giving me food. But that's not the state of mind that I wanna give it to her in. So again, it's just the patience. If you could do this three or four times in a row, you should have everything pretty much resolved. But if you don't, if you decide, eh, we'll do it once in a while, then your behavior is gonna be uh, inconsistent because the training is also inconsistent. Which means that, hey, sometimes she does great, sometimes she doesn't. Well, that's because sometimes you work on it and sometimes you don't, all right? So even this right here is triggering an associative response, right? She might even start salivating while we're playing with the food. So right here, this response that she has wasn't created through operant conditioning. This is, an, this is a classically conditioned response. Mm -hmm. Hence, this is Pavlov's dog, which, which, which is the same thing. You ring the bell, or you make sound with the food, all of a sudden, this is what ends up happening. She's, I saw her licking her chops. Yeah, yeah she's, ready to, she's ready to go. So what I'm gonna do right here, since I know that this is an emotional trigger for her for me to play with this food, I'm just gonna continue playing with it until this emotional trigger goes away. That way in the future, when I'm playing with the food, she realizes, oh, there's no point in me getting excited anytime soon. I already know this is gonna take another hour. But she has no way of associating that unless I take her through the experience. And that's why whenever you're working on dog behavior, in order to teach a child to behave in a restaurant, you have to take them to a restaurant. In order to teach a dog to be calm in a situation, you have to place them in a situation that they have to learn to cope with. Right? So. So I'm just gonna keep doing this until I see her head end up dropping and laying down and then I see that she goes in the calm state and then I'll hand feed her some more. But it's time now to start eating with patience. It's, it's time now to start teaching her to eat calmly and not inhale your food and choke. It's time now for her to learn to chew 20 times before you swallow, all right? So a lot of her aggression with eating has come from just the association that no one's controlling their child in that process of eating. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, did you have any more questions for me? I thought you said you were going to mention something else. So, while we wait, <laughs> what I was saying was the way I'm, I'm doing walks in the morning. 
um, I'm make, I'm having her when we get outside to get to the completely relaxed state of mind. Uh -huh. um, I just sit her down. I sit down. I wait for her to lay down. When she lays down, we take off. But at the top, I just have her sit, and then I go down to the bottom, and then I say, "Okay, you can come down." And that does create excitement. Yes, it does. So, is that wrong? Yes, it is. Uh, yeah. The other thing also too is because you're telling her to stay there and you've been teaching her that when I ask you to do a stay you need to calm down and do something with your mind to relax and then you reward her with excitement. Right. Right. Where you should go to her and get her. The thing is with dog training is when you do the stay command and then you, re and then you recall the dog, you start building anticipation of the release command and so now when the dog stays they don't go into a calm state like that. They get into an anticipating anxiety state because they're waiting for that recall when you're going to call me out the door or when you're going to so tell me to get out the steps. How do I get her down the steps behind me? You should retrieve her and you can step out, wait for the gong from state, and then you, you, you uh, give her direction. You pull with the leash. But you don't, know, you don't want to put her in a state command and then go outside and go, okay, come, and then teach her that she can run out of the you know, house with uh, excitement. Okay. So, so the way that, we, that we've been doing it is the way you should be doing it all the time, where I stand right there by the front door, wait for her to lay down, I step outside holding the leash, and I don't go down the stairs until I know that she's calm. Okay, so, but I'm still on the top of the stairs when I tell her to come along. Yes, you're both at the top of the stairs. She's inside the threshold, and okay. I'm just standing on the top of the stairs. All right. Okay, so we got the calm state. Gonna wait again. So this is a super common technique. This is, this is not a technique that was invented by me. Um, if you go on the internet, it's a very common technique. Hey, if your dog's food aggressive, you know what you need to start doing is start feeding your dog by hand. And then after you start feeding your dog by hand, then you can start feeding them by holding the bowl. Until so they start to build an association that um, you're not taking food away from me, you're giving it to me. And then pretty soon you can put the bowl down, and it shouldn't matter that you start to take the bowl away from the dog or not. Hey, because the dog starts realizing that you're contributing, you're not taking. So that strategy is 100% legit. But the reason why it doesn't work for some people or most people at that is because they're not waiting for the right state of mind to start the lesson. We're dealing with, uh, like in a classroom, when you have a classroom full of kids, they're all excited, they're all intense, it's a horrible time for the teacher to start teaching. So you literally have to wait for the right state of mind for the dog to learn to end up doing that exercise for it to work properly. And unfortunately, a lot of times, uh, that's not explained on the internet, or that's not explained by a dog trainer, because they're so technique oriented, strategy oriented, but they're not necessarily reading the dog as to what state of mind the dog is in while it's learning. Because if the dog's state of mind is intense and excited while it's learning this, you're not teaching the dog to not be food aggressive, you're still teaching the dog how to have intensity while I share the food with you. And that's, that's an inappropriate thing to do. Right. Again, just waiting. So this is step one. There's more steps to this, so I'm going to go through the steps. But this is step one. Right, step one is teaching her to be calm during the feeding ritual and teach her to be calm as you hand feed her. I'm going to show you step two right after, right after we do this one. All right, so there's my calm state of mind there. Okay. Step two is this portion here. Hey. Shh. Again, waiting. I want to be able to put it on the ground because that is also a separate emotional bookmark. The feeding ritual is so. What it is is she's got all these emotional bookmarks that <laughs> cause her to go intense, right? And even though it's all happening when we feed her, what you're not understanding is it's not just the feeding portion that's causing this emotional jump or outburst. 
there's little emotional bookmarks all around what you're doing that need to be worked on. Just the fact of you going to that cupboard and grabbing the bowl, that's one emotional bookmark that causes intensity. So that has to be worked on. You feeding her or how she's taking the food is a second emotional bookmark that causes that intensity that we have to work on. Me putting the food bowl down is a third emotional bookmark that we have to work on to keep the mind calm. Me grabbing the food from the ground, giving it to her is a fourth emotional bookmark. Me then taking the bowl to her is a uh, fifth emotional bookmark. And we have to work through all those emotional bookmarks. Otherwise, what ends up happening is she does good when you put the food down. She just doesn't good when you doesn't do good when you take it away. She does good when you hand feed her. She just doesn't do good when you take it out of her mouth. So you're not completing the process. You're only partially working on the triggers and you think, wow, she's improving. She doesn't spaz out anymore when I put the food down but she still bites. It's because you're only working, working on one aspect of that emotional bookmark, one aspect of that associative understanding that she's learning through classical conditioning on how things make her feel when she hears them, when she sees them, or, when, or, or whenever people do them. So, so right now I'm waiting for, hey, I wanna be able to put this food bowl down without that <laughs> emotional bookmark triggering you. And there's, the, there's where that's also gonna yeah, take some sure. calmer state, right? So, hey. And so keep this in mind. So there we go. A little bit more relaxed. So that body, that 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 was more of an acceptance body pose. It wasn't a relaxed body pose at all. Right. Shh. I need that body to be more relaxed. There we go. Now we have more of a relaxed body. Hey. All right. So I'm using that sound, right? Not as not a not as a correction. So it's not that it's not that she's doing something bad. She's not necessarily doing something bad. She's just allowing her um, state of mind to get intense. And then I'm not gonna be able to finish the lesson with that intensity of mind. So that sound, hey. Whatever, snapping your fingers. If you want to do the Caesar, you can. It's to, it's just only to get the dog's attention to look at me, so that way the dog could tell when I'm when I'm looking at the dog, the psychological portion of it, what my eyes are telling the dog. Because you can tell when the dog's eyes are looking at you, they're soft, they're excited, or the dog's targeting. You know, you could feel all that when a dog is looking at you, especially when she has a treat. You know that that stare she's giving you isn't an "I love you" stare, right? So you as well have to be just as good as those kind of looks. You have to be able to look at your son or your daughter and they know that you're telling them that you love them with just that stare. You, have, you want to be able to look at your wife across a crowded room and your wife can send you messages with her eyes. And you know what? Girls are much better at that than guys are. <laughs> you know, they, could, they, they start talking to each other and they haven't even opened their mouths. And then sometimes they'll start looking at each other and they'll laugh and then you look at the girls and go, why are you guys laughing? I didn't hear you guys say anything but somehow they were communicating with each other with the gist of their eyes. So now we got this emotional trigger that we're working on. So the body's tense right now. And the look that she's giving me is a look of anticipation of a release to go for that food. And that is the incorrect way of teaching this, is to teach her to wait and then say, okay, and then let her go for it. There we go, the body's going a little bit more relaxed. And so this, this stare that she's giving me is an anticipation is what it is. This stare is, this stare is not a relaxed stare that I want of, hey, whatever you say, you let me know and I'll go ahead and do that for you. That's, you know, that's not what that stare is. I, I prefer that she's doing that right now where she's not looking at me because now she's no longer anticipating a release command. Uh, you know, I don't want her to anticipate anything. I just want her to wait for the direction, but I don't want her to anticipate what that direction is going to be because I haven't given it yet. 
And as long as you're doing training in that fashion, heel, sit, down, come, go to your place, sit, heel again, down. As long as you're, you're drilling your dog that way with these obedience commands, you're putting your dog into anticipation state of mind every time you give them a command. They may look alert and all militant, and wow, that looks pretty cool how attentive the dog is to you, but really what I see is just an anxiety state of mind dog anticipating a command that may or may not come. You know, And that's not healthy for a dog's mind. Right. So are you saying when you're ready for her to, um, when you want her to eat, do something. She doesn't know what that is. Yeah. You'll say something, do something, whatever. Yeah. So, you know, right now she's still, she's, right now she's, this is also a clear understanding to her who's controlled with that resource. It's clear to her that it's, it's not her food. It's clear to her that I'm controlling that. But it's also clear to her that I'm the one that gives it. You know. Before, she's not understanding that the food comes from the grocery store. And before she's not understanding that that's where you keep it in that closet and then that you're providing it to her, as far as she's concerned, that stuff grows in the closet on its own and it belongs to her. And when you put it out, it's her opportunity to take it from you. Complete misunderstanding, right? But there's no way of us explaining it to her properly. There's no way of teaching it to her properly if she's going to be in this intense state of mind because if she's in this intense state of mind, then she's... She's not even understanding that we're trying to teach something right now. She has no understanding that we're she's trying to we're trying to get her to learn something. She's just excited, and so and we and we don't want that. Shh. Hey. this is going to take a little a while for her because you have to understand that her going for the food or her growling or her snapping at you you may consider it a conscious choice she's choosing to bite you she's choosing to lunge for the food and and that is not actually what's going on when she's doing all of that stuff to you it's not a choice that she's making i'm going to bite larry for going near my food because he should know better it's nothing to do with that what it has to do is that she's just so intense and excited is just a muscle reflex. Like if I took a ball and just threw it at you, you would dodge, right? It wasn't a thought, it was just there's a ball flying at my face, I need to move, right? And then it would be very difficult for me to teach you just to take a hit. Try not ducking, I, just, I want the ball to hit you so you can learn what it feels like. <laughs> and that's a, such a hard thing to try to counter, that's a reflex, I can't help it. It takes a long, long time to learn how to calm your mind, control yourself, and realize, oh, okay, the ball didn't fall. Um, which is something that, so we have the calm state here, which is great. Shh. All right. Shh. All right. And because she's not in a super intense state, it's so easy to take her from this anticipation state back into the calm state. So once the mind goes calm again, I'm going to show you the third step to this portion. Or actually technically the fourth step. First step was just trying to get her to be calm during that ritual. Second step was hand feeding her from here. Third step was hand feeding her from the floor. Now this, this fourth step I'm going to do is um, hand feeding her with the actual bowl. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to do that in a second. And because she's not in a super intense state, it's so easy to take her from this anticipation state back into the calm state. Okay. 
So once the mind goes calm again, I'm going to show you the third step to this portion. Or actually, technically the fourth step. First step was just trying to get her to be calm during that ritual. Second step was hand feeding her from here. Third step was hand feeding her from the floor. Now this this fourth step I'm going to do is um, hand feeding her with the actual bowl. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to do that in a second. Hey. Shh. I'm gonna do something a So I'm, I, I know that we have like a short amount of lessons, right? So that's why I'm showing you all the steps, but I don't want you doing all, of, all everything that I'm doing right now, I don't want you to be, I don't want you to do this every day. Oh, thank God. No, I want you to do just that for maybe, until you notice that she just lays down and lets you do that, lets you prepare food, lets you bring it, and she doesn't rush to go over to see you prepare the food. So I get the food out, she's calm, and then yeah. I let that's, her get that's all that you're mastering right now. All you're mastering right there is just, hey, wait for me to get the food prepared. I just want you over here. You don't have to be on my feet looking to looking to see how the food is being prepared. And then I can bring it over and... And then and that is going to be... Yeah, and then... No, don't set it down. The second portion is going to be having the bowl up here. And then this, and then you're going to be hand-feeding her from the counter. So but that, I do that all at the same time? No, you could break it up. Okay. So... Okay, so... so, like, so okay, so tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow morning, mm -hmm. I get up. I, I make sure that we complete the first step. Yeah, and just that's it. And then, well, she still got to eat. Yeah, and then feed her and how and you normally do. And, and just as as normal. Okay. Yeah, as normal. Just focus on. I just want you to to have little victories. And your first victory is she lays down. She's calm as you're preparing the food, and she never gets up once to go see what you're making. That's your first victory. Second victory. Is feeding is, is waiting for the state of mind to go calm, which it's not right now. Wait for her to lay down and grab the food from the floor and give it to her. Sweet, that's the second victory. Third victory is being able to put the food bowl on the ground, have her be calm and still, and start hand feeding her from the ground. That's your uh, fourth, uh, third victory. Fourth victory is what I'm, I haven't done yet, is to take the food bowl, put some kibble in there, Hand her the bowl so she eats out of the bowl. Wait for the mind to go calm. Grab some more kibble, put it in the bowl. Hand feed her with the bowl. To change the, because we're trying to change the association of the bowl some as well. Sometimes when you have um, food aggression, um, not all the time, but a lot of times when I work with clients, it wasn't food aggression towards the food. It was, it was resource guarding the bowl itself, not necessarily what was in the bowl. Because the, once we took the bowl away, the dog could eat off the ground. You could pick up the food in front of him and hand feed him, and he didn't care. But once you put it in the bowl, the bowl was the associ association of representation. Hey, shh. The bowl was the association, the representation of what was causing all the intensity. And so we don't know. What, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's just any of the food right now, because you said it's not just the food she resource guards, she'll resource our toys and stuff too. Um, but we want to make sure that we're working on this bowl as well because this bowl right here is a representation Just this bowl and that sound and remember the leash that you're using that leash that you were using when we first met yeah. That leash itself was a representation of something and then you're switching leashes now Right, so sometimes changing The tool that you're using will change the state of mind of the dog you know, and uh, or sometimes even buying a different bowl is just buy a red bowl that's not the bowl I usually resource guard, so I'm not gonna resource guard that bowl. Bam, fixed. And that's why sometimes taking a dog into a new environment, sometimes boredom training works really well, because as soon as you take the dog out of its environment, everything changes, and now you have a clean slate with the dog. The dog's basically been reset like an iPhone, and now you can start working on exactly the new apps that you wanna to upload to the dog, right? You know, but then sometimes when you go back to the, to the where the dog belongs, back to the house, 
Then the dog realizes, hey, these are all the old apps that I used to have, and the dog starts using those again. So, there we go. So see here, I'm holding the bowl. All right. Can you look up here? Can you face me? So you can see what I'm doing? So now I'm putting more food in the bowl. Hey, but now I have to wait for the right state of mind. Because that's not the right state. So we're waiting. When as soon as I see that she lays down, she calms down, then I'm gonna go ahead and hand her the bowl again. Right? And then there's and then there's one more to this. Um, one more step, and then I'll show it to you in a second. I'm waiting for her mind to go calm. I'm gonna do this one more time and then I'm gonna show you the next step. I'm, 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 I'm rushing through. I don't know when I'll see you again next, so I'm actually, I'm, I'm uh, watering down future lessons to squeeze them all in here. Because right, there's right. some more stuff I still wanna show you in the next lesson on how to take things away from her. Right now, we're just, I'm just showing you how to change her state of mind from these triggers. On the next one, um, if she's aggressive towards something, I want to teach you how to take them from her. And, the, and, uh, and that will be on the next lesson. Okay. That way you have all of this out of the way. Like, okay, Tony, Tony showed me how to do each step, and I'm going to work on that probably for the next three weeks. All right. On the next lesson, you don't have to worry about waiting three weeks. You'll continue working on this. In the next lesson, you can make it next week if you want to, or even tomorrow. Just uh, We're just going to work on something different. But I want to make sure I get all of this out of the way. So if you guys take another trip or I don't see you for a while, you know what the game plan was supposed to be. Right, right. And then I'll get that video somehow. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can upload it to YouTube on a private link. And, okay. then, uh, and then I'll just send you the link and you can have it. Um, if the internet sucks so bad where we live, it, takes, it literally takes three days for me to upload any video. I don't have to splice that and edit it. Or, I don't know if we can plug in my iPhone to your computer and you can drag, drag, the, file, drag the videos over. That might be faster. Or I'm not sure how well your, your system works here. Because um, I know if you plug in the USB cord, if you plug in the uh, iPhone cord into the phone and then it has that USB portion that goes into the computer and then it asks, do you want to allow the computer access to the phone? And then you hit yes. And then when you go into your files, you can see the files and you can just take the videos and drag them, drag them over. You can do that as well. So well, you can give that a go. Yeah. And then I don't have to try to upload it to the internet where I'm at. It just takes forever. So far, this is a much better state of mind for her to eat and for Penny just to wait patiently for the food. She knows you're feeding her. There's no misunderstanding. Before, when I first started, and I put the food in the ground and you and, and you put the, she was already shoving her nose. Oh yeah. And the bowl before we even dropped the bowl down. Yep. And that's not, uh, it's not a good state of mind to feed the dog in. So this is good. Bam. Really quickly before I give her this food bowl, um, another thing that I wanted to say as well, and you can, is that um, the body postures I gave you are a barometer for what state of mind she's in. As you get better at this, you won't, you won't necessarily rely on that. So for example, she may be sitting and you can just tell that that's not an anticipation of movement. I can just tell she's already calm. I can just, I know her really well. So she may be sitting, and I told you that that's an anticipation movement, don't feed her yet. But you could tell, you know that that's not. You could tell that she's calm. And that could very well be, and you don't have to wait for her to lay down. The reason why I'm, I'm telling my clients, wait for this clear communication before you feed her, is because right now at this point, my clients aren't really good at reading dogs. So it's gotta be a clear black and white body posture so they don't put themselves in a situation um, that the learning is unproductive. 
But once you're recognizing when your dog is fully calm, you see the eyes go soft, the ears are relaxed, and you realize she's calm, you can go ahead and feed her even if she's in a sitting position. Okay, that's down the road. But I'm just saying right now, these are clear 100% she's calm. And sometimes that's more important right now for clients to know, uh, to be sure. Which right. is real, you know, so, so to, is to be sure. So, so I'm going to go ahead and feed her. Now this is a step I want you to do is as you feed her, so that she's uncomfortable with that. You betcha she is. All right? But I have the food. So that's something that she has to be used to, right? So you can see as she was eating it, right off the bat, she froze. And, and that is where she's used to saying, hey, you know what? Um, uh, that's, that, are you gonna disturb me? Are you gonna take it from me? Um, you're bothering me. This is where this lip is coming up. I, I, don't touch me while I'm eating. She, that, that is an old association that she has in her mind that you're interrupting me, my eating pattern, right? So you notice that I have to wait for that state of mind to go calm, and she has to learn that while she's eating it, that affection is part of the process. So after I fed her, she took it, I put the bowl away, and I'm giving her affection, so she's clearly realizing that this feeding ritual that we're now doing isn't a competition, it's not competitiveness, I'm not trying to steal your food, it is a form of affection. We eat as a pack together, and that is super normal. So here's her break, here's her love, so she knows that nothing horrible is happening. Right? This is good. We're just changing the way we eat dinner now. That's all. Right? So. Okay. And then we wait again. So right now she's already, um, that's an anticipation still. That attention that she's giving me is an attention like I'm being good, right? It's just, when is it going to happen? So we're waiting. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna feed her the bowl, and then I'm gonna start petting her. And this is where taking the time to work with a dog is super, super important. You know, the old dog training model of one hour sessions is, is out the window. There's very few dog trainers that really do the whole one hour session thing anymore because they realize that the one hour sessions are very unproductive. You know, you leave in the middle of that, you leave, you leave because you're being constrained to a time limit um, because you have another appointment or because that's all that the client has time for and you're leaving in a moment that the dog hasn't learned anything yet. And it's right. super, super unproductive. You know, there shouldn't be any time limit to a dog trainer's services. It's, hey, can you help me re uh, resort to my f the food aggression I'm having? Sure. You know, we're going to do a little 10 sessions or whatever. Well, how long is each session? I have no idea, but that's not important. The important part is that we're going to have 10 sessions. I would personally say don't schedule anything for at least an hour or two uh, during our session. Not that it's gonna take an hour or two, but it can, and we wanna make sure that we don't rush it. So, so right now, let's just look at her right now. She's, in an, she's sitting, and I told you already that's an anticipation of movement, but she's not looking at me, nor is she interested in the food, right? So, and like she's about to go down anyway. That's not an anticipation of food. So because of that, technically, that this is good. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna put it away. Hey. Oh, baby girl. Oh, baby girl. You got a booger on me, just so you know. <laughs> 